Welcome back guys, it's DDP, back to bring you some more Mavericks lists here. And today we're going to be focusing on the worst contracts in Mavericks history. Now obviously this is all based on hindsight, which is oddly something that I was sort of criticized for in my last video when I talked about Cuban's biggest regrets. But man, what else is a review of something other than hindsight? You see how it plays out and then you determine whether or not it was a good decision. Now in that video especially, I let off by saying not every regret is based on bad decision making. Sometimes you can make the perfect move and things just don't play out right. So let's take a look at some of the worst contracts in Mavericks history using the gift of hindsight. Mic check, 212, bitch. Number five. Brandon Haywood. Ooh, Brandon Haywood. All right, so for those who remember Josh Howard's departure from the Dallas Mavericks, he was traded to the Washington Wizards, with Haywood essentially being the focal point of that trade. Dallas was looking to upgrade from Eric Dampier. Now, Dampier was still there, but they wanted a new starting center, which they would get in Haywood. It also didn't hurt that they were going to be getting Karan Butler in the deal. Dallas effectively was getting two starters and a bench guy in Deshaun Stevens in return for Josh Howard, who clearly was on a gradual decline and was not the all-star caliber player that they had seen in 2007. So believing that Brennan Haywood could be the big man of the future for the Mavericks, Dallas was quick to reward him in 2010 with a six-year, $55 million contract. I don't know why I'm over jazz handling these videos lately, but I seem to be. Six years, $55 million for Brendan Haywood. That is a significant investment for a guy who, although he served as a pretty good backup throughout his career, his contract in Dallas did not pan out. First, in the season in which he was acquired, Dallas was bounced in the first round by the San Antonio Spurs, with Haywood providing little lift to the Mavericks defensively. Then, after getting his big contract, he was effectively beaten out by a much cheaper option in Tyson Chandler, who that offseason came into Dallas and took his job. So you're paying $55 million to a guy that's not even a starter for you. Don't get me wrong. I loved Haywood as a backup for the 2011 championship run and considered him pretty invaluable to what Dallas was trying to do. But that's still a lot of money to be paying for a guy who's not even your starter and whose stat line is nothing impressive to look at either. When Tyson Chandler then departed Dallas that offseason, Haywood became the starter again, but it didn't seem to really affect his bottom line. Of his six-year contract, Haywood saw two full seasons in Dallas, and during that time, he had averages of 4.4 and 5.2 points per game. He would then be released the following season using the amnesty clause. Not exactly a sound investment, but it could be worse. At least he helped contribute to a title team. Number four. Evan Eschmeyer. Now, I'm not even 100% sure that I've pronounced this correctly, but let's just roll with it. Evan Eschmeyer spent four seasons in the NBA, splitting time between the Dallas Mavericks and the New Jersey Nets. And what's crazy about this is in 2001, when he signed with Dallas, Cuban gave him a six-year deal worth $20 million. Now, the money value might not be high, but a six-year contract to a guy that held career averages of 1.5 points and 2.5 rebounds a game? Oh my god, why would you invest in a guy to just warm the bench for you? It has to drive you insane. He rarely ever played. It was just a confusing deal where you look at something and you wonder, well, what was the competition to acquire him? I can't imagine there was much, and certainly not anyone offering him a six-year contract. So this is one of the more puzzling, albeit inconsequential, contracts in Mavericks history. Moving on. Number three. Eric Dampier. Holy crap did Dallas overpay for Eric Dampier. 
In Eric Dampier's final season with the Golden State Warriors, he averaged 12 points and 12 boards a night. That's not bad. The problem? When Dallas gave him a 7-year, $73 million contract in 2004, he would never come close to replicating that success. Instead, his best year would be his first year in 2004 in which he would average 9 points and 8.5 and boards. It only got worse from there, however. As his numbers would decline year by year until his final season with the Mavericks when he was averaging just 6 points and a little over 7 boards a game. That's hardly a guy worth the money Dallas was paying him. Even still, Eric Dampier did get a chance to get vengeance on the Mavericks the following season when he signed with the Miami Heat as part of the LeBron, Bosch, and Wade super team. Now granted, he clearly wasn't a member of that super team, but he was at least on the bench to, you know, flick the towel around and pat LeBron on the back and tell him, hey, great work, man. So Eric Dampier was on the Maverick side of the equation in 2006 and then got to be on the Miami side in the rematch. That's an unfortunate break for a guy who made two finals appearances. Dampier would play just two more seasons after leaving Dallas. The aforementioned 2011 season and then one more season with the Atlanta Hawks before retiring. Number two. Rafe LaFrance. Now tell me how many of you actually remember Rafe LaFrance. This is a more puzzling one because at least Eric Dampier saw six out of those seven years on that contract with Dallas. And it was the trade chip Dallas actually got from moving on from Dampier that allowed them to go get Tyson Chandler. Facts. We don't have that story with Rafe LaFrance, unfortunately. In 2001-2002, Rafe LaFrance was sent to Dallas from the Denver Nuggets. Not a bad pickup, you say. Well, upon his arrival, Dallas would reward him with a puzzling 7-year, seven $70 million contract. Fun fact, Rafe would see just one year of this contract with Dallas before being traded to the Boston Celtics and quickly flaming out. Now, as far as his game, there was a lot to like about Rafe LaFrance, but when he arrived in Dallas, he was a shell of the player he used to be. This was an unfortunate development for the Mavericks, who, with LaFrance on the roster, actually made a charge in the 2002 season all the way to the Western Conference Finals, where had it not been for a Dirk Nowitzki MCL sprain, probably would have gone on to face Jason Kidd's New Jersey Nets and likely win their first championship. Admittedly, I'm a little bit partial here as I really became a fan of the NBA in the late 90s and I got to watch these three come together in Dallas and develop into something that was really nice. It was the first real big three that I ever paid attention to and I wanted so badly for them to win a championship. I was heartbroken when Nash left to go to Phoenix. And finally, number one. Worst contract in Mavericks history. Now, this one's not the worst money spent, but considering it happened in the same offseason as the Eschmeyer six-year $20 million contract, I have to wonder what the hell Mark Cuban was thinking. I'm referring, of course, to Tariq Abdul-Wahad, who received in 2001 a six-year $40 million contract from Dallas. Now, of that contract, Wahad would see just two seasons coincidentally same as Eschmeyer, but he spent a lot of time on injured reserve, therefore still getting paid. This one is your number one because Cuban himself described Wahad as a lazy player, saying he didn't really want to practice. He didn't really want to train. How you give that guy $40 million is beyond me. How you do that in the same offseason that you just gave Evan Eschmeyer $20 million? Bro... Dude, you just made me say, bro, who am I? In total, Wahad would play just 18 games for the Mavericks in those two seasons, racking up two years worth of pay on injured reserve. That, that is a fine, fine disaster. But wait, there's more. I actually have a bonus entry for you guys on this list here, one that I did not initially plan for but came across during my research. 
I'm talking, of course, of one Sagana Jop. You remember Sagana Jop. I remember Sagana Jop. We had so much fun in his breakout season with the Mavericks, which was when they went to the 2006 finals, by the way. Now, he was originally viewed as a bust, as a colossal bust with the Cleveland Cavaliers before kind of being redeemed in Dallas. That season, he averaged just under four and a half blocks per 48 minutes, good for the fourth best in the league, and Dallas' defense was significantly better with him on the court. So all in all, he played a nice role for the Mavericks, but he would ultimately depart from Dallas as part of the Jason Kidd trade of 2008. Now, that's not the contract I'm complaining about, because that was a mid-level exception. What I'm referring to is when Jop came back just months later after the Jason Kidd trade in 2008. It was then Dallas rewarded him with a five-year, $31 million contract for a guy whose best days were already behind him it's one of those head-scratching moves that Cuban had a knack for making in the early 2000s. Granted, at this point, we're talking 2008, but nevertheless, it makes you wonder from a financial standpoint if Cuban understood the monetary value, the appropriate monetary value and worth of these players he would sign. Now, in recent years, I think Dallas has gotten much better and become more shrewd with its money, but it's decisions like this, the five primary and then the one bonus I outlined, that really makes you wonder, what, what's the vision? What, what is it we're trying to build here? Two of them, counting in the same offseason, is especially bad, but at least those are far enough in the past that they can kind of be excused for the most part. In fact, the most recent of these items is the Sagana Jop bonus of 2008. Since then, I've had people who asked me about this list, wanting to know about Harrison Barnes and guys like that, Harrison Barnes doesn't make this list. Harrison Barnes, is he overpaid? Yes, but by no means is he a terrible player. He is what they need right now. He gave them their first, albeit somewhat small, building block that they have then since built on with Dennis Smith Jr. and Luka Doncic. With that, they can build something. Now, does he factor too far into the team's future? I'm not sure, but I know that they're pretty high on him all the same. So he could be around for a few more years, potentially, if he re-signs beyond this current deal. So I never considered him for this list. But these other ones, whoo, oh boy. If you guys have other ideas for a list you'd like to see me do, whether Mavericks or Cowboys or what have you, let me know in the comments below, and we'll go from there. If you like someone else's suggestion, like the comment. Let me know what you want, and I'll do my best to deliver. That's all my time for today, guys. I've been DDP with the Dallas Prospect, and remember... Every legend was once a prospect. prospect.